For decades, Disney has been synonymous with family-friendly entertainment. Yet they actually killed numerous animals while filming a documentary in order to fake a scene from nature. Keep watching for the terrible truth. Walt Disney's first all-live-action production was 1950's Treasure Island, one of the best adaptations of the novel to date. As the AFI catalog details, the film was made entirely in Britain due to a unique situation after World War II. Revenues collected by studios in the United Kingdom were frozen, only able to be spent on productions within the country. This meant an all-British cast, except for young Bobby Driscoll as Jim Hawkins. Unfortunately for Walt Disney, Driscoll was a little too young at 12 to qualify for a labor ministry permit to work in Britain. According to the AFI catalog, this dilemma grew into a court case that fined the studio, Driscoll, and his father 100 pounds each, and barred the lad from working in Britain. When an appeal was filed, Disney took advantage by rearranging the schedule of the film to get everything with Driscoll shot before the hearing. His dodge cost $84,000, which is equivalent to $1 million today, earned a strong rebuke from the judge, and scared Disney off trying to bring Driscoll back to Britain for any future films. But he got everything in the can in time, and without any of the horror stories that defying child labor laws can bring upon a production. Walt Disney loved animals, and when he began to diversify his filmmaking in the 1940s, nature documentaries focused on wildlife proved one of the most stimulating experiments for him. The True Life Adventure series that resulted were some of Disney's most profitable short-subject films, thanks to their low production costs. In their day, they also brought in considerable praise for bringing the animal kingdom to moviegoers. But the picture of nature presented by the True Life series wasn't exactly the unvarnished truth. Running narration anthropomorphizes the animals in every one of the films. These scripts, written in advance, demanded footage that the natural world wasn't always forthcoming about. So as Snopes notes, the film crews hired to film the animals sometimes staged what they needed. On one occasion, the filming of the 1958 White Wilderness, this sadly meant turning a few dozen imported lemmings off a cliff and into the icy water below for the sake of a scene meant to illustrate the origins of the myth that lemmings commit mass suicide. Whether Disney knew or approved of the stunt is unknown. The truth wasn't revealed to the public until the 1982 documentary Cruel Camera sparked outrage over the treatment to the animals. Walt's nephew, Roy E. Disney, for one, didn't think it was a big deal. We've lost a few lemmings. Okay, you know, the lemmings probably would have gotten lost anyway. It's never been easy to combine live action and animation, and it was much harder back in the 1980s. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a technically grueling shoot. Actors had to react to co-stars who weren't there. The director and cinematographer needed to account for where the cartoons would go. Puppeteers and effects crews needed to manipulate inanimate objects that would be affected by said cartoons, and animators and effects artists labored in post-production, according to Cinema Blend, to create the animated characters and composite them into the live footage. Compared to all that work, the job of a voice actor is supposed to be easy. Turn up in the recording booth, read your lines, and go home. Except that didn't apply to Charles Fleischer, voice of Roger Rabbit himself. He was there on the set to deliver dialogue, provide sight lines for Bob Hoskins, and stand in for Roger in rehearsals. In fact, Fleischer was prepared to go the extra mile to help the film along. He told the Orlando Sentinel that he had a Roger Rabbit costume made for him to wear every day so he could appear on set in character. It made for quite the sight in the studio commissary, but who can argue with his methods when the film turned out so well? I came to call it trans-projectional acting so that whatever he was doing, I would watch it and I would project myself into that space. Walt Disney was unique among Hollywood film producers in seeing television as a boon to filmmaking rather than competition in the early days of the medium. After early forays into TV with hour-long specials to promote upcoming releases, Disney Studios launched the first incarnation of its anthology series, Disneyland. It advertised films in production, aired original programming, and helped sell the public on the theme park concept, with friendly Uncle Walt acting as the host. Disney was, at times, just as jolly as he seemed on TV, but it wasn't effortless for him to get that onto film, and missed cues and flubbed lines could bring out another side to his character. Mouse Planet records an interview with cameraman Bob Broughton, who said that when Disney messed up his cues, the first words out of his mouth were some choice curse words. He goes back and we do another take, and the page with his lines falls out on the floor. So he says, oh, sh**. He does it a third time and drops the book. He says, oh, sh**. At this rate, I'm going to start flubbing the words, oh, sh**. And everyone bursts out into laughter. Yes, Ed Wood is a Disney film, or at least a touchstone one. The weirdness of Ed Wood was largely confined to the subject matter of a legendarily awful director surrounded by outcasts and misfits and the unusual found family that they formed. 
The shoot was reportedly a relaxed, happy affair, but according to screenwriter Larry Karaszewski, there was one moment of panic when Ed Wood's widow Kathy Wood, who was played in the film by Patricia Arquette, stopped by the set unexpectedly. Karaszewski's writing partner Scott Alexander was happy to grant Kathy's request to meet Johnny Depp, who played the eccentric director. En route to Depp's trailer, however, Alexander remembered that they were filming a scene where Wood is miserable and in a disheveled state of drag. He and Depp were both worried that it might give her the wrong impression about the tone of the film. Depp, in particular, was afraid she might think they were mocking Ed Wood, but it turned out they needn't have worried. Upon seeing Depp in his dress and smeared makeup, Kathy smiled and said, "'He looks just like my Eddie.'" Far from being displeased, she ended up giving Depp her late husband's wallet and ID, which Depp carried with him for the rest of the shoot. Watcher in the Woods was one of several darker, PG-rated fantasy films produced by Disney in the early 80s in an attempt to escape the rut that captured the studio after Walt Disney's death, and it had impressive credentials. Its director, John Huff, was a Disney veteran who had also directed horror, and it starred screen legend Betty Davis, who marked a 50-year anniversary in show business at the time of the film's initial release in 1980. Davis was 72 when she filmed Watcher, and that posted a difficulty for Huff. Davis's character appeared at different ages throughout the film, and according to Huff's DVD commentary, she was determined to play the younger scenes herself. Makeup artists were flown to England from Hollywood to see if it could be managed, but in Huff's estimation, it knocked about 20 years off of her age, but not 40. After screening the test, Huff cleared the room and told Davis he didn't think it worked. In true movie star fashion, Davis responded by taking a drag of her cigarettes and snapping back, "'You're god right!' Yet another of Disney's early 80s sojourns into the dark side was Something Wicked This Way Comes in 1983. It was a film long in the making. According to AFI, Ray Bradbury first wrote the story as a directing vehicle for Gene Kelly before turning it into a novel, and then back into a screenplay for his friend Jack Clayton to direct. Sadly, when Disney picked up the project and launched production, it meant the end of Bradbury's friendship with Clayton. In the Bradbury Chronicles, The Life of Ray Bradbury, the author lamented that his friend Clayton went behind his back to hire another screenwriter who wasn't as experienced in the fantasy genre. Between the script changes and Clayton's direction, the initial cut of the film shown to preview audiences was a disaster. After consulting with Disney executive Ron Miller, Bradbury advised rewrites and reshoots. All the cast and crew returned to service, including Clayton, but Bradbury himself unofficially directed the reshoots while Clayton watched from the sidelines. Ultimately, Bradbury felt that the finished movie still wasn't great, but was at least better. Saludos Amigos was an odd production from the get-go. During World War II, the American government asked Walt Disney to go on a goodwill tour of South America. Disney recalled his reluctance years later to go on a handshake tour until the offer was amended to allow Disney to make films on Latin American subjects. But I'd feel better about going down and really doing something instead of going down and shaking a hand. A small number of hand-picked staff accompanied the boss on the trip to gather material. After all the research and handshaking was done, a handful of cartoon shorts were packaged together for a 1942 release. On the screen with those cartoons and Saludos Amigos was live-action footage of environments, locales, and cultural practices from South America. This wasn't staged or slickly produced Hollywood photography, but raw 16mm footage from the artist's tour of the continent. And according to the Walt Disney archives, a chunk of the coverage and Saludos Amigos came from Walt Disney's own camera. Likely the only time one of the most powerful movie moguls in history doubled as an uncredited cameraman on his own film. As well known as the Disney name is, it was for much of its existence a small studio on shaky financial ground. This instability was, in part, due to Walt Disney's tendency to plow any incoming monies back into expensive productions. When he spent $9 million, the most expensive film ever made up to that time, on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, it was a huge gamble. The gamble seemed a disaster in the making once filming began on the legendary Squid sequence. In Disney's The Making of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, director Richard Fleischer revealed that even years later, he was still pained by the memories of the first attempt at the scene. It washed out pink sunset backdrop with cheesy lighting and a practically worthless squid puppet that fell apart while filming. Disney was less than happy when he saw the results. And he said, I've been watching what you're doing here. He said, you're making a keystone comedy cops movie. Faced with a disaster of an action sequence, Disney told Fleischer to move on while the technicians at Disneyland built a new squid. Disney also enthusiastically approved writer Earl Felton's new concept for the battle as taking place at night in a fierce storm to disguise the puppet's shortcomings. The new puppets and all the wind and wave machines necessary tore the movie's budget apart, to the point Disney had to bring bankers to the set to convince them to fork over more cash. But the resulting sequence still holds up to this day, and the film became one of the highest-grossing movies of the year. 
You might think that if there were injuries while filming a movie about a giant gorilla, especially one filmed before digital effects became the norm for creating such beasties, those injuries would involve the gorilla. Not so with the 1998 remake of Mighty Joe Young, though. No, the real disaster for Joe was thanks to a crane. During filming, a camera platform was mounted 18 feet above the ground with cinematographer Don Peterman aboard. Shockingly, the crane supporting the platform snapped. According to the Los Angeles Times, Peterman and the camera operator were thrown to the ground. Peterman suffered a broken leg, broken ribs, and head injuries, but he and the operator both survived. Despite the accident, Peterman managed to complete the film and get in one more credit before eventually retiring.